It's time to buckle up, folks, as we've got groundbreaking information to share with you. Because of the unprecedented geopolitical turmoil with the Trump presidency and the financial markets, Kenneth Amaduri of Crush the Street has invited David Stockman, who previously served as the director of the Office of Management and Budget under President Ronald Reagan, to share his thoughts as well as discuss his brand new book, Peak Trump, The Undrainable Swamp and the Fantasy of MAGA. Given his extensive track record, we've compiled a list of his accomplishments and analyses at crushthestreet.com forward slash David. With so much dynamism baked into our markets, you can't afford to miss this vital information. Once again, please visit crushthestreet.com forward slash David. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's David Stockman. Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. Another hard-hitting interview I have for everyone today. It's a New York Times bestseller, David A. Stockman. He's the ultimate Washington insider and someone who's uh, sounding the alarm. Uh, he's got a resume that you know it will just blow anyone away. Director of uh, Office of Management and Budget for President Ronald Reagan. His website or his, yeah, his website is David Stockman's Contra Corner. We'll have the links in the description area. And he's got a brand new book, Peak Trump, which we'll uh, get into today. Uh, David Stockman, thanks for coming on Crush the Street with me. Very happy to be with you. Sir, uh, let's start here. Uh, yep, yeah, let's start here. Uh, you were on CNBC, and I gotta say, uh, you were hammering Trump on his economic policies enough that the hosts of the show were actually playing devil's advocate and having to say some good things about him, which is kind of an odd thing. But um, yeah, you know, with that in mind, tell us a little bit about this book and, you know, some of your thoughts on what's going on with Trump now. Yeah, well, you know, on that CNBC show, they were defending Trump, but only indirectly, not him, but the market, because I'm basically saying in peak Trump that the market peaked September 20th last fall after a 30 year run of massive debt uh, in our uh, private and public sector, a Federal Reserve that, you know, uh, went from a 200 billion balance sheet when Greenspan started in 1987 to the peak of 4.5 trillion uh, uh, last fall. And that, uh, you know, we're at the end of the road, uh, that this was really uh, an unsustainable fan uh, fantasy. You can't uh, borrow and print your way to prosperity. You can create great bubbles. You can create, you know, uh, artificial uh, expansions for a apparently extended period of time. But you can't defy the laws of sound finance uh, and honest money indefinitely. And so uh, I, I uh, insist that uh, we're in for a big correction sometime in the next year or two that uh, recessions haven't been outlawed by the economic gods. <laughs> We're at month 116 of this current expansion, the second longest in history, 119 months is the longest, and that was the 1990s tech boom where uh, circumstances were far more uh, benign and propitious, let's say, uh, than they are today. Uh, so uh, there's no way that we'll make, uh, make it to November 2020 uh, without the next recession incepting. And when it does, the uh, stock market uh, will crash and uh, Trump uh, will be in a pretty uh, serious retreat because he promised to make America great again. Uh, and that was uh, at least as to the domestic economy. And yet he's adopted policies that will only make it, uh, you know, more indebted uh, again uh, in terms of massive expansion of the uh, federal uh, deficit, but also the enormous pressure on the Fed not to normalize, not to shrink its balance sheet, uh, and thereby to somehow keep uh, debt flowing to the private sector and to Wall Street, uh, and thereby uh, perpetuate um, you know, this uh, uh, artificial uh, prosperity that we have going now. Um, 
you know, so his policies uh, are only going to make things worse. The trade war only compounds it. And uh, they didn't like to hear that. I guess I was down there at the New York uh, Stock Exchange because, uh, you know, the uh, bubble vision people are there to cheerlead the market and insist that whatever it takes, the government needs to do whatever it takes, the Fed, uh, the fiscal authorities to keep uh, the stock market going higher, whether that makes sense, whether that's sustainable or whether that's, uh, you know, uh, honest, uh, co uh, uh, constructive uh, policy or not. So uh, every time I go uh, on CNBC, we tend to get into that, uh, you, know, you know, that dispute. Because, uh, you know, the whole financial market is caught up in what I call the Draghi syndrome, whatever it takes. Uh, and it doesn't matter how bad it is, uh, you know, and how uh, unfair or unsustainable it is. And we can get into a number of those factors. Uh, the idea is uh, just keep it, uh, keep the ball moving uh, one yard at a time, keep the index rising uh, one point at a time. And we'll worry about the future uh, in the by and by. Well, you know, that that can that has lasted for a while. I, I agree, but I don't think uh, it uh, is the basis uh, for a permanent uh, uh, prosperity. Sure. Well, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, I know you're speaking very objectively. You've looked at the numbers and you're saying, hey, this is what I see, this is what I think is happening, and this is where the, the facts are indicating uh, the way things are going to play out. But I'd like to ask you, you know, what are your personal uh, beliefs or what do you desire or what would you like to see happen? Uh, you know, whether it's the Trump presidency or, you know, policies to play out that would uh, best help this situation. Well, I think we got We have to get the country, both the public and the private sectors off this debt kick number one, and i give some numbers about that in a second. And second, we need to get the Federal Reserve the hell out of the financial markets off Wall Street and bring the free market back in and let prices be set by supply and demand and all of the massive wisdom that exists among the tens of thousands of people that uh, might be trading the markets if uh, it were a level playing field. If, if they were two-way markets and supply and demand rather than Fed speakers and Fed uh, interventions uh, were uh, controlling the day. Those are the two big things that would make all the difference in the world because the debt is so great, there's 70 trillion on our economy today, public and private, that it's suffocating growth. Uh, and the Fed is so out of control that it's basically bifurcating the economy, creating endless and ever more egregious bubbles on Wall Street, even as that detracts from Main Street and leaves Main Street uh, basically flatlining. Uh, in my book, Peak Trump, I use one statistic, which I think quite dramatically uh, proves my point, And that is, if you go back to the fall of 207, before the crisis, uh, kind of the peak before the crisis. Assume we're somewhere near a peak today in the next cycle, 11 years later. So the way to measure the economy is always peak to peak or trough to trough, but never peak to trough or trough to peak, because that's just uh, you know talking point spin. It's not uh, honest analysis. But if you do that, here's what you get. Uh, on the stock market, Wall Street side, the NASDAQ 100, which is really the leading edge of the tech boom in the stock market that we've had over the last decade, is uh, it was up 200% as of the uh, highs last fall after inflation. So I'm, I'm saying even if you allow for inflation, that's a 200% real gain in the leading index of the tech-based uh, stock market boom we've had uh, uh, since the crisis. On the other hand, if you go to Main Street, there are three good things to measure. One is labor hours put to work. The second is industrial production, uh, which includes both utilities, energy, and manufacturing. Uh, and the third is household uh, median uh, real income. When compared to the 200% gain on Wall Street, what you have on Main Street is zero gain in household real median income. 
3% only over 11 years gain in industrial production. That's nothing. It's a, you know, it's a stagnating economy. And only about a 7% gain in total hours employed, which is the right way to look at the labor market. The unemployment rate is totally meaningless because it counts apples and oranges and kumquats. Uh, what I mean is if you work 10 hours a day at McDonald's at the minimum wage, that's a job. And if you work 60 hours a week overtime in an auto plant, you know, making 80,000 a year fully loaded, uh, that's a job. Well, you know, they're not comparable. But if you look at hours, at least uh, you've got some better metric on what's going on in the labor market. And the answer is 11 years, less than a 7% gain in the total uh, hours employed. So, uh, you know, uh, just, just uh, think about that then, 200% on uh, Wall Street uh, over 11 years, practically nothing, a flat line on Main Street. That, that can't be sustainable. That can't be reality because at the end of the day, stock prices are nothing more than discounted uh, uh, economic and uh, cash flows. Uh, discounted uh, growth of the economy and cash flows of the companies that comprise it and there's just no way you can have one going 200 percent and the other going nowhere uh, indefinitely it won't work so i think uh, you know this apparent decoupling has been entirely artificial it's been been driven by a out of control of fed which has stimulated huge uh, bubbles with cheap debt and massive liquidity injections through its bond buying into the stock market but at the same time it's hurt the main street economy uh, far beyond what um, you know they would ever admit or even what critics uh, uh, point out but uh, I think it's important to note that when you turn the stock market into a casino and that's what it is it's a gambling casino you essentially uh, induce uh, encourage the C-suites, uh, corporate boards and management, to engage in nonstop financial engineering. <laughs> you know, that is buying back stock, uh, borrowing money to uh, enhance their dividends, borrowing massive uh, amounts of money to do M&A deals uh, that might boost the stock temporarily, but in the long run, almost all these M&A deals, uh, you know, fail. So uh, when uh, the C-suites, uh, corporate America is 100% practically focused on financial engineering, that pumps a lot of money back into Wall Street. Uh, it gooses stock prices, but it actually strip mines uh, the real uh, balance sheet and cash flows of corporate America and results in uh, less investment, less productivity, less efficiency, and so forth. Then. On top of that, you have this idiotic notion, in my view, of a 2.00% inflation target come hell or high water. Their theory is that that makes the economy grow better. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. 3% uh, inflation or 1% inflation or 0% inflation would not produce any different result, probably, than 2%. And yet, by insisting on more inflation and inflating the economy at least at 2%, they're simply driving up costs, prices, and wage levels in nominal terms and making the U.S. economy more and more and more uncompetitive compared to all the cheap labor uh, industrial uh, economies in East Asia, China, and elsewhere around the world. So the Fed... Uh, on Main Street causes an offshoring of productive uh, activity, uh, industry, and jobs. Uh, it causes the, the, uh, the C-suites, the managements of corporate America, to underinvest in productive assets and overinvest in financial engineering. And that's why we have, uh, we've had the weakest uh, by a long shot, uh, recovery uh, in uh, all of history because Main Street uh, is being hobbled by these Fed policies, even as it's been coupled with this uh, fantastic, uh, you know, boom and recovery in the stock market uh, that I think uh, is not uh, sustainable and is based on uh, 
you know, uh, artificial liquidity or fiat credit in the trillions that the Fed has pumped into the financial system. This is a bad deal. It's a, it's a bad policy regime, uh, and it's uh, seriously uh, undermining uh, true uh, sustainable prosperity uh, in America. David, uh, let's talk then about the tariff situation. Um, you know, from sound money, Mises School, tariffs on paper are bad. Uh, but, you know, I, at least I want to believe, and we'll let you, I'll let you respond to this, it's sure. more nuanced than that. You know, will there be battles and victories won with countries playing uh, more by the U.S. rules than continuing to take advantage based on posturing and, you know, talking tough, what, what have you? Are, are there any goods to come out of tariffs, in your opinion? None. Zero. And the reason I say that is that when you get to fundamentals as a matter of philosophy, uh, trade is not the business of government. And whatever they do or don't do in China, uh, if they foolishly subsidize their industry, if they have a form of capitalism that I call the Red Ponzi because it's all built on unsustainable debt, you know, that's their problem. If American companies go to China and they're uh, pressured into sharing their technology, that isn't Washington's uh, responsibility to remedy. Uh, if a company doesn't want to be pressured or shares technology, don't go to China. Don't go on CNBC and bragging about how much growth you have in the future because you're in China if you don't want to play by China's rules. So uh, this whole trade uh, battle is a huge mistake. Trump is utterly wrong about it, uh, about the cause of it. He's right about the symptoms, these massive deficits we shouldn't have, but he's wrong about the cause. It is not caused by bad trade deals and stupid, you know, people in the uh, trade, USTR, the State Department, or prior uh, presidents. It's caused by bad money. It's caused by the Fed and also uh, the reciprocal action of the central bank in China and elsewhere around the world. So if you want to fix the, the true problem, then uh, you need to uh, you know, walk a few blocks uh, from the White House to the Eccles building, clean house, and tell the Fed to get the hell out of the uh, financial markets to stop pegging interest rates, to stop monetizing the debt uh, and and subsidizing uh, the you know 15 trillion dollars worth of debt that the household sector has today and on which uh, they overconsume and therefore uh, over uh, import from China but we don't get we don't start taxing Walmart consumers who uh, live hand to mouth anyway, and those are a lot of the red state voters, ironically, that voted for him. We don't put a tariff on them, which is what a tax is. It's not a tax on China. It's a, you know, it's a tax on domestic users of Chinese imports, in order to get even, uh, you know, with uh, Beijing in terms of what their rules of the communist road are. In, in what I call uh, the Red Ponzi. So this whole thing is going to lead to a big mess. It's not going to go away. The idea that there's going to be some, you know, moment in time like March 28th at Mar-a-Lago where they shake hands and resolve the issue uh, cleanly and permanently on a one-time basis, that's just baloney. They have got, Trump is a statist. He has got the government now into another huge domain of micromanaging trade, and we could talk about some of the, you know, dilemmas you're going to get into, um, and uh, that uh, is just going to make uh, uh, the whole thing uh, worse. But also, it means that it's never going to go away. Once you start, uh, you know, laying out seven, you know, twenty-seven different um objectives that the Chinese are pledged to meet and enforcement mechanisms to monitor and ensure that they happen and then dispute resolution when it doesn't happen by our lights and it does by theirs you know you're, you're talking about another whole uh, sort of uh, monster uh, government operation that is the cause of our growth issues 
and our trade issues and not the solution. So uh, to sum it up, uh, Trump is putting into place a trade nanny in Washington that is only going to uh, further hobble the ability uh, of American business uh, to invest, uh, become more efficient, grow, and, and help raise the standard of living. David, uh, you called what Trump is doing at the border a border war on immigrant labor that we need. Um, and I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? To what extent does illegal immigration that is happening now help? And can you address you know, what exactly is needed with this immigration uh, policy? Do you, are you against a wall, for a wall? What, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I'm against the wall on the Mexican border, and I'm for a wall around domestic welfare. If you just made and enforced uh, rules that said if you're not a citizen, you don't get welfare, period, not food stamps, Medicaid, emergency assistance, housing, any of the rest. That, in theory, is what the policy is, but it's got so many loopholes in it that um, it gets abused. So if you're worried about people coming here uh, to live off the taxpayer, put the wall around welfare, make it absolutely firm, and you've solved that problem. If you're worried about crime, that that is totally a function of illegal drugs, uh, and there shouldn't be any illegal drugs, okay? The drug war, the war on drugs has been a colossal failure. It's resulted in, uh, you know, un, untold mayhem and violence at the border and in uh, the distribution networks in America. You get rid of that. You uh, put the job of uh, importing uh, drugs, uh, give it to uh, Philip Morris or uh, you know, uh, to uh, Amazon, for that matter, uh, order it on your computer, and all the violence would end uh, in uh, a few uh, weeks or months, okay? So that's not a problem. And the third thing is, they're only illegal because it's a misdemeanor, and if we simply said at the 48 border checkpoints on the Mexican-U.S. border, stop in here, fill out a form, uh, one page, uh, and it's a work permit. And as long as you can get it stamped by your employer month after month, because you got a job, you can stay here as long as you want. And if you're uh, working uh, and uh, collecting uh, W-2 uh, stubs for five or 10 years, you can earn your way to citizenship. And the reason I say that is that the native-born um, workforce is actually now shrinking. We've reached the point on the demographic curve, and this is baked into the cake. You can't reserve, uh, reverse it because the babies that would be needed uh, to increase the workforce, uh, you know, five years from now weren't born uh, 20 years ago. Um, the native-born workforce is shrinking, and there is no way that the United States can remain solvent if we have a booming retirement role because the baby boom, 80 million strong, is going on Social Security Medicare at a huge rate in the 2020s. Uh, and have that coupled with a shrinking labor uh, force and economy that generates less and less revenue to pay for it. Can't work. So we need labor force growth. We need much stronger economic growth than we've had to generate the revenue to pay for this welfare state that nobody wants to uh, tackle or reform or shrink. Or if you don't do that, you're going to have a disaster. And um, you know, so therefore, Trump's war on the border, first of all, it's a phony crisis. Uh, you know, the number of illegals so-called uh, uh, apprehended at the border is down about 80 percent from where it was at the turn of the century, uh, first uh, few years of the century. Uh, it's not a crisis. Uh, it's all manufactured uh, as a you know, political rallying cry, uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, reality as far as I can tell. And it's getting in the way of um, the uh, smooth inflow of workers that we need. The idea that, uh, you know, uh, immigrants are taking jobs is so much baloney because America wouldn't exist without uh, immigrants over the last hundred years. And the more immigrants we have, the more people we have working 
uh, the more uh, prosperous we become. So uh, that's why I say um, you solve the problem with guest worker permits uh, uh, for people to work, not a wall to keep them out. Sure. Well, and all things I agree, and I like the way you put that, not a wall around the border, but a wall around around U.S. welfare. Oh. And, because that's really, I think, what, people, what frustrates people is that people come here, they take advantage uh, of the system, and, you know, it's a system that's afforded to them. So it's not their fault. Um, so having said that, I want to segue to back to the economy. We're seeing a rising stock market after we had some volatility as we ended 2018. But we're also seeing gold rise in the face of a rising market. And my question is, are we seeing a sea change that gold is signifying anything different in the economy? Because we are seeing stocks rise, but gold's also rising. So is gold telling us something in this environment? Yeah, I think it is. I think uh, on the margin, it's becoming increasingly uh, apparent, at least to people that pay attention, that the central bankers of the world have no clue what they're doing. They're making it up. They promised that, you know, this massive expansion of their balance sheet from 900 billion on the eve of the crisis to the peak of 4.5 trillion a few months back. That that was all emergency, extraordinary, 100 year flood. One time it would uh, get the economy back on its feet and then that they would, uh, uh, you know, retract that massive uh, balance sheet uh, expansion because, after all, that's just fraud. If you permanently expand the balance sheet by three and a half trillion like they have since uh, September 2008. That's three and a half trillion of fraud. They bought real bonds that funded real labor and uh, aircraft carriers and government salaries and everything else uh, with uh, credits that were uh, made out of thin air on their uh, digital printing press. So uh, they, they said, uh, even Bernanke said in late uh, 2012, and Powell was already on the board by then, the Federal Reserve Board, oh, no, 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 don't, don't accuse us of monetizing the debt. That's, uh, you know, we know that's a terrible sin. Uh, this is just temporary. It's emergency, and we'll shrink the balance sheet down uh, once uh, things get stable. Well, here we are now, <laughs> uh, 2019, and they started to shrink the balance sheet. The market gives a little hiccup for a couple of weeks in late December, and all of a sudden, what was on automatic pilot, as you recall, the balance sheet QT, the shrinkage, $600 billion a year, is suddenly not only uh, on uh, pause, at least rhetorically, but, you know, they're leaking uh, to the press and they're getting uh, Goldman out there to pronounce uh, officially that, uh, you know, the balance sheet shrinkage will be over by September. Well, if you do the math, they can't get it under $3.6 trillion, uh, and it really shouldn't even be much more than $1 trillion where they started uh, eight or nine years ago. So what, what they're doing is uh, Bernanke was lying or in the face of... Uh, a hissy fit in the market, they're making up another uh, excuse uh, to keep, uh, to, to attempt to keep the bubble going. But I, I don't think uh, they're going to get away with this indefinitely because it, with each twist and turn, uh, I think more people recognize they're just sliding by the seat of their pants. They're making it up. I mean, there's stupid theories that they keep coming up with almost every day, like, well, we've undershot our inflation target of 2%, which in itself uh, is uh, dubious. I mean, there's no real reason for a 2% inflation, except it gives them an excuse to have easier money and lower interest rates. But now they're saying, well, we had quite a few years where we didn't quite make it, so we should have price level targeting not price change targeting per year. And if we undershoot uh, uh, for a few years, we get the overshoot for a few years in order to catch up. I showed the other day and something I put in my blog that, well, if you go back to the year 2000 and you said they must absolutely keep the uh, PCE deflator, which is their favorite uh, measure of uh, uh, inflation, you know, the PCE, de personal consumption expenditure deflator, if you kept that at 2.00% year after year, then it would be at 143 today compared to 100 in the year 2000. 
uh, but it only is at 138.5. So what they're really saying is that the economy would be much better today if the uh, you know PCE deflator were at 143 versus let's say 139 rounded, that's it. That's ridiculous. There's no basis for that. That's just uh, you know uh, a made-up excuse for why they are going to duck and dodge again when it comes to uh, the real issue at hand, which is normalizing uh, uh, monetary policy and getting their fi big fat thumb. Uh, off the scales in terms of interest rates. The same thing is true with this uh, new invention that they toss around called R-Star. Now this is supposed to intimidate you because it sounds like it's algebra or something. Mm -hmm. And what it really is, is uh, you know, the, the so-called natural rate of interest, which they uh, divine to be 2% uh, at the present time. This is the money market rate rather than 3 or 4% that used to be uh, the case or uh, as it was uh, uh, previously viewed. Now here's the point. Our star it doesn't even exist. It's totally a, a academic fiction that uh, is being made up by the same central bankers who want to use it as a justification for keeping interest rates at the absurdly low levels that they're at today. Well, what I'm saying is they're just making this whole thing up. It's it's complete nonsense. No one can know what the natural rate of interest is except the market, and uh, they don't let the market work. They peg the interest rate. Uh, so um, it's just another example of why it all relates back to gold, that these uh, uh, jokers uh, on the central banks uh, have, uh, you know, backed themselves into such uh, uh, a corner of so much uh, illogic and false promises that uh, the market's going to figure out they've failed. And when it becomes clear that central banking, the modern version, I call it monetary central banking, the central planning, uh, has failed, uh, there is going to be a, a fairly... Uh, you know, substantial rotation to gold as the one asset that these uh, failed bankers, uh, central bankers, uh, can't destroy, create, or in other ways uh, distort. Well, I would definitely agree with you on that, and uh, I'm very optimistic as to what we're going to see in gold this year. I really was pounding the table earlier. In the year and you know that's really how we started off 2019 was hey you know you got to be looking at gold here in 2019 and sure enough it's uh turning out to be a, a really exciting asset class to be looking at especially if we start to see things come unhinged going forward here which uh, you strongly make that case. Uh, so having said that, uh, David, please give us some closing thoughts. And if people want to learn more about you, what you're doing, read your book, let them know where they can go and what they can expect to find. Okay, well, uh, the uh, book, uh, Peak Trump, uh, uh, the subtitle, uh, I think, is more uh, revealing. The subtitle is The Undrainable Swamp and the fantasy of MAGA, you know, Make America Great Again. Uh, that is available on Amazon, both uh, the ebook uh, and the printed book. And uh, it is a pretty good uh, summary of uh, how we got here, uh, why Trump got elected uh, by Flyover America, because clearly they've been left behind in favor of Wall Street. But uh, what needs to be done versus what Trump has proposed, which will, in my view, only make matters worse, not better. So that's one thing. Second thing is that I do uh, publish a newsletter or blog, whatever you want to call it, daily of commentary about all the things we've been talking about today, the Fed, the financial markets, stocks, uh, uh, Washington policy, uh, deficits, uh, what's going on in the world, plus foreign policy. I'm a very big non-interventionist, anti-empire, pro-America first uh, 
guy in my orientation, among many reasons. One, it's not our role to police the world. No one, uh, you know, uh, in, endowed us with uh, the, that capability or right. And second, is bankrupting America because the warfare state, as I call it, costs more than upwards of a hundred billion, uh, upwards of a trillion dollars a year if you count all the debt that we pay for wars and all of the veterans that we have to take care of uh, who are victims of these unnecessary wars and uh, it's, it's bankrupting us between the welfare state and the warfare state uh, it's no wonder we have the fiscal crisis that we do well my day, uh, daily blog which comes out uh, five times a week called David Stockman's Contra Corner uh, addresses uh, all of those things and you can just google it and uh, it'll take you right to the site uh, to sign up Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so much, David, for coming on Crush the Street. Uh, your time is very appreciated here. And uh, again, we hope to have you on in the near future.